Ladies and germs, welcome to The Alchemics Show, episode two. I'm your humble host, Tommy Paul. They call me Tommy Alchemy on all social media. They call me Tommy Alchemy because I'm an alchemist. I can turn base metals into gold, and that's why I'm humble as well. I'm kidding, of course, and to us, uh, the modern alchemists are the chef, the distiller, the bartender, the people that believe in creating something from nothing. And we're doing the show because we're actually moving our headquarters. Uh, I really want to see if this is something that you guys are into. As I said yesterday, uh, the things that I enjoy most about the show are sort of talking about the business side of things and how we help uh, businesses, you know, restaurants and bars through um, utilizing social media for them and consulting and opening new places and exciting stuff like that. It just comes naturally to me. Some people don't like the nitty gritty, but uh, that's what we're doing here. So I, I want to curate an audience of people that really enjoy the business side of whatever it is. Talk about the whiskey business, spirits business in general, um, hospitality, bars, restaurants, things like that. So if you're into that kind of thing, uh, so, but sorry, basically what I was trying to say was we're preloading content in the studio because we're going to be moving to a different state. I left New York and now I'm leaving Colorado, uh, for obvious reasons. And we haven't decided where we're going yet, but we're going to get into that probably at a later date, uh, a little bit today. So, uh, we're still going to be releasing projects, but uh, I just wanted to see if this is something that you guys like. So for the next couple of months or so, we're going to try to do an episode every weekday. So if you're into that kind of thing, uh, like, comment, share. That's the best way you can help us out. And what we're talking about today is the slim margins of the hospitality business, 10, 15, 20%. If you do more than that, you are a you're really good at it. Uh, how bar owners can increase profit margins and how we've helped bars do that. The cocktail, I guess it's not a cocktail. The drink of the day. I'm drinking Siete Luegas Reposado. Um, it is quite good. Um, I originally got this for a Paloma video because I think a part a punch article about the Paloma. I believe it was written by. David Wondrich called for this. So I've had this for a while. It's a great sipping tequila, though. It's almost a shame to put this in uh, a Paloma. So that's what I'm sipping on with a lemon twist. I love a lemon twist with a reposado. A reposado tequila. Uh, it's just like just a tiny like little bit of bitter spice on the rim of your glass. It's quite nice. So cheers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we're also talking about the leaders of information in this industry. Um, some of the articles that came up on that note, the best well spirits, according to bartenders, this is from punch, forget your call drink. Miami's El Salon has removed liquor branding from its bar. And this video will be sponsored by <coughs> ourselves, Alchemics Consulting, but more on that later. So first up, I want to talk a little bit about the slim margins in hospitality, bars and restaurants. This applies to other things like hotels and things of that nature as well. But um, so people have an assumption that these people, like this industry is just printing money, especially when they go to a nicer place. They just assume that this place is so nice. It's so extravagant. You know, they put a lot of design. The, dish the dishes are great. The cocktails are great. It's a little bit expensive. They must be printing money. It's not true. Oftentimes, fine dining, quote unquote, upscale uh, places, a lot of people call fancy places. Can I just talk about that for a second? Can I just veto the word fancy? I, I don't know if it's just me. Comment below if this is something that you uh, also feel in the industry or in any industry. I feel that anytime you want to put a lot into something and because it's very important to you, like a restaurant or bar putting a lot into the design and the lighting and the, and the sound and all that stuff, it's like it's kind of dismissive and almost like disrespectful. I'm not going to get offended about it, but to call it fancy. 
I don't understand these people. It's like, let's just get rid of the word fancy. Don't say fancy, especially if you're in the industry. I just like this came up in my mind because I've heard some people in the industry say fancy. I don't know about all these fancy things. Well, it's, it's just, it's part of what it is. But anyway, uh, just because the place is nicer doesn't mean it's necessarily printing money. In fact, a bar or restaurant that has higher cost dishes, a lot of times it's because it has to be. Because there's like, you know, a lot that goes into making these extravagant dishes. It's very hard to make extravagant dishes and extravagant cocktails. And so oftentimes dive bars will actually be making more money than a upscale casual restaurant or bar or upscale casual and above um, because the margins on just shot and beers are a lot cheaper. And plus you're not dealing like you don't have to have really any SOPs, standard operating, operating procedures, any. So, you know, I think that's important to remember. And that's why this industry, one of the reasons it was completely decimated over the past two years. Uh, so it's like you're operating with very, 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 slim margins. Um, so I think that I just wanted, I want to bring awareness to that fact. And also because people, it's, it's just such a tough business. It's so fickle. So as we've seen over the last two years, the flipping of the switch, as I called it yesterday, can really, really decimate somebody's entire industries. Um, so I just advise you to do a little bit of research before you decide to start a bar or a restaurant and really deeply think about where you would want to start that bar or restaurant. Um, so I think the reason why I'm sipping this is because this is pretty much my go-to in a dive. Um, contrary to popular belief, even though I do like a nice cocktail, I also go to dive bars and I enjoy some well spirits. So Comment below, what's your go-to? Let me know. You can tweet at me, Tommy Alchemy. What's your go-to uh, drink at a dive bar? I, I think my top three are going to be a neat tequila and a neat whiskey because a lot of times I won't even trust the ice. But if it's a little bit, you know, oh, you know, you just if it's if it looks a little bit cleaner, then I might go with a gin and soda. I like a gin and soda too. I have to admit, I don't love the tonic in those guns, but that's a conversation for later. So, um, so really quickly, let's just go into a little bit about how to increase your profit margins in bars and restaurants. <clears throat> After I drink some delicious tequila. So I want to point out that labor is a whole separate thing. So I'm just going to be talking for a little bit about how to increase your pro your profits, your profit margins on COGS, cost of goods sold. Labor is an entire science, especially when you're talking about cocktail bars where you have bar backs and needs to do the right amount of prep work. Same with opening bartenders and closing bartenders and how to get people in and out at the, at the right times and making sure it's fair and all this stuff. It's very, very hard. There's a science to it, and we can talk about that later, but I'm not going to be talking about that now. I'm only going to be talking about how to increase profit margins on COGS. So, you know, to put it simply, there's three phases uh, when we talk about COGS. So when we're consulting for a bar or restaurant and trying to get their cost of goods sold um, down, we... We the first thing you do is drastically reduce your SKUs, the number of products that you sell in the first place. I cannot tell you how many bars, restaurants that we walk into, <clears throat> and you go in the fridges and on the back bar, and even the kegs and taps, and there's just like there's things that people haven't used in sometimes years. And this is not uncommon. I'm not going to out anybody. I mean, this is this is commonplace. I mean, this is kind of, this is the entire ethos of like Hell's Kitchen and uh, what's the guy? I forget the bar bar rescue one. Yeah, <laughs> which people have drawn the comparison to us and bar rescue. Some because my partner can be a little bit harsh when he walks into a place, but 
you know, it's just funny. I, I do like that show, and obviously they're way more successful than us, so we're not trying to make a ridiculous comparison. But at the end of the day, Bar Rescue is successful because he's they make money through advertising on television, so they he's going to places that would never be able to afford to pay them. So they were already doomed in the first place, but that's why it's entertaining. So entertaining, in fact that more than half of them fail even after they've been rescued. And so that's why they, they did a whole reboot. I can't remember the name of it right now. But it's like Bar Rescue Reunion or something. I think that might be it. I don't know. Something like that. So, um, you know, you wa- it, it's very inefficient. Like, So one of the problems is when people continue to hire – over and over and over and over and over again, and they have this new hotshot head bartender every month, they all want to put their stamp on a cocktail program at a restaurant. Part of this is good because we've seen a lot of a lot more excitement in the last few years in the industry. So people, they want to have great products and, ser- uh, products and services, I guess, yeah, but... They want to serve great products and they want to serve great cocktails. And I think that's good. The quality I think has gone up in a long time, a lot in the last couple of years, even last few years. But the problem is that none of them really know what they're doing. They're still kind of early and some, and the, a lot of the own, like the owners that are tyrants in this industry, they know this. So they kind of prey on these people who are sort of like up and comers and they're not going to really get paid any extra to make it a cocktail menu and a program but a lot a lot of them are cool with it because they're just psychopaths they want control i can't tell you how many head bartenders don't get paid for it you'd be surprised they really just want the title like they don't you know so you know it's we to give you an example there's a place we were consulting with and we actually went back after like five months because you know, we tell people what to do, we give you the tools. And then a lot of times it's just like the inevitability is that things will start to slip. And because, you know, people, the people running the show are not up to par and the revolving door of this industry makes it very tough. So we go back after five months and everything is decimated. Okay. Well, so we have work to do. There's like just hundreds and hundreds I mean, literally hundreds of spirits and wines that are just sitting there not being used. So what happens is it becomes this like cesspool and it will kill you if you're a business owner because nobody knows how to cost it. Nobody knows how to price it. Nobody knows how to sell it. Nobody definitely knows how to put it in a cocktail and it's taking up valuable space on your back bar. So I said, okay, it's a little more drastic than before. We have three of every spirit. Point blank period. End of story. There's three of every category, basically. Vodka, gin, tequila, rum. um, Obviously. And then we separated whiskeys out by class. But still, we had about 80 products, which is a lot less than a lot of places served that included wine and beer. Most people, you don't realize, have hundreds and hundreds of products sitting on their back bar. Um, There might have been less. I don't know. I can't remember the exact number. But... When you drastically cut down your SKUs, it limits things. You can train people on how to t- sell particular spirits. Um, you can cost them out properly. You don't have to cost out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things. It makes costing and ordering way easier. So, and there's just like there's an infinite or infinite amount of reasons. So I just chose. You know, we curated three of every kind of spirit, and we said, okay, just put the rest away. We're going to use it for events. And so we're using it for events and then they they were able to make money off of it. So it didn't go to waste, but there was like four or five head bartenders in a five month period that we weren't there. And they all wanted to order their own things that they were passionate about, or maybe they knew their reps or whatever. And it became like, at a certain point, you're like, this is worse than if you had somebody bad, like it, it going through five, six, seven people. <laughs> is worse than than if you had a bad person there just an unethical and unknowing person that's actually probably better than a new person every month trying to put their stamp on things we're going to go in this into this a little bit more later 
but uh, the the National Restaurant Association came out with a stat. I might be mixing this up. I'll, I'll make sure that in a, at a later date we put out the exact statistic. I think it might have actually been a toast poll now that I think about it. But either way, there's a poll that showed based on data. It might not have been a poll. I don't know. Studies, a study that showed that I th- the National Restaurant Institution published. I don't think that they actually funded it. But anyway... It showed that the average uh, cost of hiring and training a new employee in the restaurant business was $5,800 and some change. That is asinine. That is a ridiculous amount. If the average bar or restaurant owner knew that, they would be working a lot harder to retain their employees. And we understand that the margins are slim and it's a tough time for the business and the whole thing. But... That cost is based on training, is based on like, you know, the resources that it takes to hire, to train, to get somebody up to speed. And then sometimes the, 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 the lost time where you don't have anybody in a particular position and then people are stretched thin and it's all this stuff. It's just a, it's a mess. Most people, most bar and uh, restaurant owners don't even know that statistic. So they're not actually making any efforts to retain employees, even like, If, you know, you could tell them, even if you're just purely selfish and you just want to make money, you know, that is important to understand, right? Now, obviously, you know, it's, it's easier said than done. I've never put my own money on the line for, to own a bar for good reason. That's because I know the business and we're going to do it right when we do it one day. Um, but yeah. So I do believe in treating your employees well, and I know it's hard in a business where the margins are so slim and in certain states, they're literally just shutting down your business. I understand that. But the fact of the matter is if you're not able to retain employees and high quality employees and not um, understand, be able to recognize talent, then you're screwed. That's a, that is the, that labor is the biggest cost. And hiring and training all this. And so anyway, like, it's just my biggest frustration was people not recognizing talent in the industry. You know, so that's why we work really hard to when we're consulting and we're hiring, which we do as a part of our consultancy, we train and curate talent. That's maybe the hardest part. And we try really hard not to be biased. Like we just want, because this industry is full of, unfortunately, what you call office politics, which a lot of us kind of got in the industry to avoid, but in, it's just, it sucks. Um, so, you know, we just try to make sure the highest uh, quality, most qualified person gets the job and you can solve point blank period. So that's obviously something that, you know, I've talked about ad nauseum. I, I said I wasn't gonna talk about labor, I talked about labor because I just, got a little too excited. But anyway, drastically cut down your SKUs because nobody knows how to sell them um, or what to do with them or to cost them. So that if you actually have, the point is like to simplify that if you have too many products on the back bar and in the fridges, that'll actually eat into your cost. Like there's a book, it's called the five bottle bar. It explains this a little bit better. Maybe I'll do something about that in the future, but it's, it just seems obvious but anytime you see, whether you're an owner, a head bartender, a regular bartender, you see a collection of spirits that have been sitting there forever, get rid of them. There's obviously some exceptions like, um, you know, like Fernet that people order once a decade that you need, or Chartreuse is a better example. I mean, Fernet, a lot of people go through fast, but it's neither here nor there. Anyway, so that's first is cut down your SKU. Second, actually create a costing sheet. This is the next thing that's going to blow your mind is just the, the amount of people, of owners, managers, whoever's responsible that don't actually have a costing sheet for all their cocktails, their spirits. It's like a mind fuck. You wouldn't believe how many people don't. They don't even worry about it. It's like, and I'm talking like, Sometimes success, like fairly successful bars are like, yeah, we just, you know, as long as uh, we're in the black every month, I'm cool. And I'm like, all right, well, but there's all these other ways that you could be earning more and the margins are slim. So, you know, so to actually create a costing sheet, we have basically the main idea is that you maintain an 85% profit margin on almost 
everything on average. So when you calculate bar cost, you need to make sure that your bar cost, your bar cost is 15% basically. So then the profit margin would be 85% on average. That's a good general thing to shoot for. Um, so it's not, it's not a perfect science, but on average, you have to be making 85% on every, everything for everything on average in order to calculate labor rent and all these other things for you to even sometimes make 15, 20% profit or less a lot of times. Um, so that's just very important. So the way that works is you just calculate out all the, you know, the cost of every bottle of beer, wine, and spirit. And then you, you figure out, you know, what you have to charge per two ounce pour based on how big, a like for a spirit, for example, based on how big a bottle is to keep your bar cut. And then, and, and some things like spirits, you want to have a little bit higher profit margin on because the profits on wine aren't as high, for example. So I'm not going to go into too much depth about that, but that's the second thing is like, first thing, um, drastically cut down your SKUs and then on those SKUs, create a costing sheet if you haven't already. And so on that note, oh, forgive me, I'm parched. <clears throat> For some reason, talking just makes me have to drink tequila. Okay. So, Jesus. So on that note, this video, before we get into the third thing to increase your profit margin on COGS and the F and B business, a food and beverage business, or just cocktail bars, bars in general, restaurants behind the bar. We're just talking mostly about the bar. This video is sponsored by Alchemics Consulting. The Alchemics Consulting Group offers world-class cocktail programs and team training for every level of bar, whether you're looking to make better cocktails in your restaurant or build an award-winning cocktail program from scratch. Alchemics has you covered. Reach your full potential as a cocktail bar. I just read my own copy off the website there. The three people who are now part of the consulting group at Alchemics have an accumulative seven Michelin stars under their belt. That's places that we've worked at. We've helped open more than 20 bars and restaurants. And so if you visit alchemics.co and then click consulting, you can see some of the places that we've consulted for, some testimonials, and that's a good way to reach out. You just ask for email, name, phone number, and then the establishment that you represent. If you would like, uh, so if you're opening a new bar or restaurant, consider Alchemics Consulting. The third thing you can do to increase your cogs in the bar and restaurant business is the or maybe the most important, depending on where you are, but that is to do brand deals. So uh, basically, in other words, you once you have a little bit of a reputation, you can go to reps, and oftentimes they'll come to you. Actually, they are they are like I don't know. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. They're kind of like rats. They'll just find you. So if you have any high, if you have any decent quality bar or restaurant that opened, whether you're, you know, the owner, the head bartender, whatever you may be, they'll, they'll find you, but it also makes sense to reach out to them. Now, with the way we set it up is we usually wait at least three months to have a little bit of proof of concept before this stage happens and when we're consulting because it gives you leverage. So the entire job of reps is to get their spirits on the back bar. So when you do brand deals with them, they might be want to be on the back bar, the cocktail menu. Um, but when you do brand deals with them, you want to always negotiate the best possible deal you can. Maybe it's a free bottle per case. And I mean, I've negotiated like two bottles, two free bottles per case to be on the cocktail menu. And they also understand that if their product is on the cocktail menu, that's very valuable because people say, Ooh, what's that? You know, it's, it's in the cocktail. It must be good. So 
it's social proof, it's authority bias, it's right there in front of people's faces. And so that's, uh, that's basically the entire job of these reps. So the good news is that it basically is, can help you a lot because they're, they're purely selfish and they don't care about you. So I should make that clear, but, uh, it can help you out a lot because when you get a free bottle per case on one of your well spirits, it's in a cocktail. You can, I mean, that helps significantly to get those margins up on the cocktails and the cocktail menu. So this is an important strategy that's often overlooked. And, uh, you know, what I, what we've realized, I think, with the consulting group is that you don't have to be the best bar in the world. You don't even have to be that good, frankly, to get some of these deals. They they just want to know that people are going to these places. Have some kombucha. So... You know, I don't know. I should I shouldn't have called them rats. There's some that are great. I've had experiences that are great with the reps, uh, and others that are just horrible. So I'm in Philly, and we're consulting for a bar, and uh, I'm actually just working behind the bar. And as because as we're hiring people, I'm you know back there to maintain maintain quality and actually working shifts. So we had just come out with a, uh, a new cocktail menu and, you know, we're just working. It's the beginning of a shift. That's when reps will typically come in. It's the beginning of service because they don't want to bother you when they're busy and they want to talk your ear off and sell you stuff. And I'm fine with that. It's just you have to, like, if you understand that, that can give you a lot of leverage. So, um, so I'm there and we're, we had a tequila cocktail there on the menu and it was really good. We worked really hard on it. We almost always reverse engineer our cocktails based on the spirits that we want to work. Like we want to, you know, we want on the cocktail menu. So this is very well curated. And uh, the cocktail was made with uh, Espolon Reposado. And uh, the rep walks in. I didn't know he was a rep at the time. Sits down orders the cocktail. And I, and, and so after he gets halfway through, I'm like, Hey, how's the cocktail? What'd you think? He goes, it's good, man. But you know, I think it'd be better if it was made with S And I'm like, kind of sitting there in shock for a couple seconds. And so I was, I'm like, so I, I didn't even know what to do. I go, Hey, how are you? I'm Tommy. Shook his hand. Let's, and I go, let's start there. I actually said that because I'm like, do these fucking companies not like give their employees uh, like a sales course or sales lessons? At all? Like what the hell is the matter with you? We actually worked very hard on that. So I, I didn't say that, but I was frustrated. So I just introduced myself. We talked a little bit about it. I got his card to basically get him to leave, threw it in the trash, and I never drank Espelon ever again. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, frankly, it's not just that, it's not that great of a product. So, and unfortunately in Philly, you actually can't do brand deals. It's illegal because of the PLCB. If you don't know what the PLCB is, it's the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board. And what that is, is in essence, a tyrannical group of dictators that, that control the entire distribution of liquor in the entire state of Pennsylvania. So it's very hard to get your product in liquor stores and in bars in that state. It's like insane. I don't know. I think it had something to do with the Quakers. I don't know the history, but I know that it's ridiculous. So consulting in Philly is a whole other beast because of this 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 bullshit basically yeah i mean you can just you can just for those of you who are there you know it sucks they're horrible to deal with they you, in essence you need to pay somebody off to get your your spirit on you know in lick in to legally to sell in the entire state it's craziness so you know but i'm like these, so, you know, look, a lot of interactions with reps are a little bit better than that. But if you understand that most of them are dumb, 
then you actually have a lot of leverage. So you can negotiate better. So the way we did it, so in most states, you can do brand deals. It, I don't see why it's not, you know, it would be a problem. But the way we did it is we worked it out so they would have a buyout for an event. So they would come and bring people. Didn't actually turn out to be that much of this of a success because this rep was just some like hot shot who was like supposed to be working in clubs, really. So he just thought, so he didn't, he didn't actually end up, it didn't actually end up working out, but there's a, there's going to be a lot of them. And so they, they, you know, they had a, they had a minimum purchase that their company just gives them money to buy, do events and to, they, they, they come and they buy their own products. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a blessing and it's a curse. And I think we're going to, we're going to actually get into that a little bit more in a second. It just, I don't want to go too off the cuff because so first of all, um, Brings me to my first article. Um, it's by Brad Thomas Parsons, who's now a writer for Punch. I like Brad Thomas Parsons. He uh, he wrote the Amaro book, which I really liked. It's literally just called Amaro. We have it. I've referenced it before. And he's a good writer. And uh, so it's the best well spirits according to bartenders. I think it's pretty well done. I think... Uh, I like it a lot. Uh, The first paragraph goes, quote, while the well-lit bottles standing at at attention on the back bar get all the attention when a guest pulls up a stool and scans the scene, it's the unseen rack of well liquor stationed out of view. Sorry, I need to, I just need to make this bigger. I can't, I'm trying to read off something really little. It's the unseen rack of well liquor stationed out of view under the bar top that acts as the load bearing backbone of the bar, carrying the weight of service and sales throughout the night. This is absolutely true. Um, most of the time when you do these brand deals, you're going to want to do them with spirits that you go through a lot of like your well spirits or the spirits on your cocktail menu. This is one reason why it can actually be, we're going to, they talk about this in the article too it can actually be advantageous to put spirits in the well that are a little bit more higher end than just like the worst of the worst. Because if you can do these deals, you know, you can get, you can get, you can have high quality spirits for a lower cost. Uh, so, you know, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, it's the stuff in this for cocktail joint, especially it's the stuff in the, in the speed rack that really, that you're selling a lot of that is the most important um, for, as he calls it, the load bearing backbone of the bar, carrying the weight of service and sales through the night. This is why I am not ever going to be a writer because that's pretty poetic and beautiful in a way that it doesn't really need to be. But anyway, um, this stash of bottles was once deployed Quote, this stash of bottles was once deployed solely for the purpose of quickly banging out popular rail or called drinks like rum and Cokes, vodka sodas, gin and tonics. It's true that the well is still the foundation of the spirit plus mixer set, but many bars now stock their wells with diverse lineups of high quality spirit spirits and liquors that can deliver excellent cocktails without disrupting the bottom line. The most popular in any category. So, you know, this article will obviously leave a link as always in the description and show notes. <clears throat> this article is riddled with product placements, just as the Amaro book was, but I don't have any problem with that at all. I just sometimes it's a little bit obvious, but, you know, a lot of times that's just how these people make money. And I've been thinking about this a lot. I think I have this set to, to... So vodka, they basically did a poll. Punch, and I guess I was actually supposed to get into... Punch is considered one of the one of the actual gold standards of cocktail magazines. And, and, they, and they really are. They've done us a great service. I think they... They do a really, they have a lot of different writers. They do, they do a good job and they really highlight a lot of uh, bars and restaurants in a good, in a good positive way. So they brought attention to a lot of places and I think that's great. Then it's obvious that they're for sale. 
Um, like, cause death and co is like just littered everywhere. And I don't have a problem with death and co. It's just like, they, they're a little, you know, it's like, dude, you guys like death and co quite a bit, but so they did a poll. I don't know how big it was or what their, their pool was, but their data seemed to show that vodka. So they go through every category of spirits, right? And the most popular spirits put in the well for what you might call cocktail joints or upscale places. So uh, the most popular vodka was Tito's, and I think uh, I think Tito's deserves that place. They did such a good job over the last ten years of marketing branding. Uh, they actually are a great example of a company that, when they were starting, especially, they had reps that did it right. And their buyouts were huge. So in other words, they would come to your bar or restaurant and they would buy just like an exorbitant amount of Tito's. Like unreal. Like some of the, the amount. It's just like, so bring a bunch of people and then they buy a bunch of Tito's and then it just gets people drinking Tito's and then they buy everybody else Tito's. And so, you know, so I, I think they are, you know, so that's Texas pot still vodka, I think. Yeah. Uh, and they did get sued. I think they might have not got sued. I don't know, but there was a controversy. I don't want to speak on this unless I know I'm just thinking of this. Now there's a controversy of calling it organic. I think at one point or something like that, because I don't know. I don't remember exactly or gluten free. That's what it was. So I'm just going to touch on this quickly. Cause I thought of it. Distillation removes all gluten pretty much unless yeah, no, it removes all gluten. So I believe that nothing distilled has any gluten. So if you see gluten-free on any spirit, it's just a dumb selling point because distillation removes all gluten. All spirits are glute, gluten-free, point blank, period. It is stupid and it is dumb. But I don't really care. It's just important to know that. Um, I like Tito's because they kind of debunked the premium vodka argument. So like... If you're going to drink well anything, I think that vodka would be the thing to drink because by definition, by legal categorization, <laughs> first try, I almost never get that word right. Uh, it, it has to be colorless, flavorless, and odorless vodka. And that's throughout multiple countries. I for, So... So like what Grey Goose did was kind of brilliant. It was create this premium vodka category. And there is stuff that's quote unquote smoother than others. And then there's some that's distilled horribly. So there's definitely bad vodka. But but the idea that, and I'd like Belvedere. I have it. And that's kind of in that category. But, you know, it's like, I understand that it's, it's, uh, how would you say? It's like, you know, rich guys, and gals, they just like to drink it because it's it's a status symbol. That's what I was looking for. It's a status symbol more than anything. And Tito's proved that you can get great vodka down to a very cheap price because vodka is kind of vodka. I'm sorry to the vodka people for getting mad at, if you get mad at that. I can, I do have a palate where I can taste different vodkas and I can tell differences because there is in differences in distillation and the different things. That I, I understand that. But it's it's legally supposed to have no color, no flavor, and no odor. <clears throat> so that's just one thing. So uh, the honorable mention was Kettle One. Um, Alex Jump, bar manager of Death & Co. Denver. I've been to Death & Co. De Denver a couple of times. It's pretty close to home here. I, it's, I like it a lot. I think that it's totally different. And for, for those of you who are familiar with Death & Co. New York, that's like tiny speakeasy hole in the wall. Denver is much more big, open, glass windows. It's in a hotel. It's so, I actually like it more. And I was a little bit optimistic because Death & Co. actually opened their uh, second cocktail bar in Denver before LA. So that kind of told me something about the market and I'm from here. But then just spending the last two years here, I, I understand it's unprecedented time, but there is not, I have not been impressed with the cocktail bars in Denver. But Death & Co. is good. Um, we're going to talk later about how they're allowing people to invest right now. But that's neither here nor there at the moment. So Alex John Barman, Death & Co. Quote, uh, Kettle One is not our well vodka, but it does live in our well because we move through it quite quickly. 
This is, in my opinion, just irrelevant for the article and clearly a product placement. And Death & Co. does a good job of this. And I think this is like a punch slash Death & Co. promotion for Kettle One. So whatever. Kettle One's good. I like it. Um, gin was beef eater. So this is where I get a little bit excited. So um, there is a guy named Paul McDonald who I got to meet once when we were – doing the top cocktail bars in Philly uh, project that has been filmed and is now being edited. I don't know when it's going to be out, but he's super cool. He's the head bartender at a place called Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So he was actually in this article. So it was kind of timely and awesome. Um, I was in Philly like literally last week. Uh, and he says, whether paired with bitter tonic, or dispatched in dispatched in a Negroni, Martini, or Gimlet. The pol or sorry, this is actually the whole quote. So, Beef Eater won in the gin category. The article says, whether paired with a bitter tonic, or dispatched in a, dispatched in a Negroni, Martini, or Gimlet. The pulled bartender still have a thing for Beef Eater. While Paul McDonald, head bartender, Philly's Friday, Saturday, Sunday considers Beef Eater. One of the most underrated bottles on the market. He admits you simply can't beat the classics. And bartender favorite Ford's Gym performed well with London Dry Stalwarts, Tanqueray, and Bombay. Is that is that a thing people say? Stalwarts. I don't know what that means. I'm an idiot, but is that... Is stalwarts a word that people just use casually in a conversation? I mean, this is an article, but still. Isn't there an old thing? Like, uh, writing is weird to me. I, I remember somebody once told me, always use always in, in writing. Like, don't use ridiculous words that are, nobody knows. Maybe I'm dumb. Stalwart, a loyal, reliable, or hardworking supporter or participant in an organization or team. Okay, great. Could just said supporter, fan, whatever. Uh... With London Dry stalwarts, Tanqueray and Bombay Dry, along with Citadelle French Gin nipping at the heels, talking about Beef Eater. So, yeah, Beef Eater is, I think, the London Dry of London Dries. It's very good, very juniper. Um, it seems like they have their boot on the neck of a lot of these organizations because... Like they said, the best Negroni ever is made with uh, um, Beef Eater. And this is maybe Spirited Awards. I don't know. I'm just, I can't remember exactly. But it's it's good. It's London Dry. The, at the end of the day, it's not that hard to make London Dry. Sorry, that is what it is. Now, Citadelle French Gin. Now, I'm no fan of the French. But I like this gin. I'm kidding. This is, the Citadelle is actually in my top five um, French it, why do they have to say French? Yes, it is French, but Citadelle gin is in my top five gins. It's incredibly good. I have it here. It's very citrus forward and herbal as well. It's, I love it. I love it. It's very good. So, yeah, so I'm just kind of, you know, I, I'm, I like I wanted to bring up Paul McDonald too because he's referenced in this article. And he, if you go to this place called Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and they're known for food too. They're very, very, it's very, it's like hard to get a reservation there. And actually, so we went in Philly and we, you know, filmed some of the stuff and took photos and all that. He was just one of the guys that was just really cool about us being there and taking photos and all that. And we did a shot of something. I can't remember what it was. Damn. But uh, he also is an example of a guy that uh, is marketing himself really well. So I'm going to leave a link to his Instagram below. And uh, because I looked at his Instagram because that's how I kind of connect with bartenders. And he's like, the photos are gorgeous. And I was like, dude, are you a photographer? The, he had great cocktail photos. And I'm, he's like, no, nah, I just do it with the iPhone. And I'm like, what? He's like, and I like, so I'm like, do you edit it? You edit your photos? He's like, yeah, but like only on Instagram as I'm about to post. Just so you know, just, you know, take a shot. And I'm like, whoa. So, you know, it's hard for me to hear as a kind of like, because I, I was a photographer. I mean, I still am a photographer of cocktails. I do it now and again. But 
you know, I'm not really resistant to change. And he's an example of somebody who it's, you can't make excuses. He's marketing himself as the head bartender there really well. And I think he's worked there for more than five years. So I made a video of him making a cocktail. It was really cool. We had a great time. Food was great. Drinks were great. Loved it there. That, that place is going to rank high um, in the Philly cocktail bar reviews. Anyway, rum, uh, they separated by categories. Most popular white rum was Plantation Three Stars. I think that's a good pick. So nothing really to say about that. Most popular age drum, El Dorado Five-Year-Old. I don't think I've had that, uh, but it's just interesting. Uh, most popular overproof rums were Smith and & Cross and Ray and & Nephew. I guess, um, yeah, those are both very cost-effective uh, rums too. So that makes sense to me. Now, tequila, the most popular was Cimarron Blanco. I think I'm saying that right. As a as a well, uh, as a good, decent well spirit. So I don't actually think that I've had that. I'm going to have to consult with my tequila people because also in Philly is a place called Tequila's Philly. And I want to give them a shout out. It's fantastic, fantastic food and drinks. And I went there and there's a guy, the head bartender at Tequila's, his name is Dan Suro. And he was also awesome. In fact, I think that um, I'm pretty sure if I remember properly that Paul from Friday, Saturday, Sunday actually referred me and he said, go to Tequila's. You'd be surprised how good the cocktails were are. And because I was asking him like other places to go in Philly that, you know, bartenders recommend. So I went there and I was like, that's like one of my favorite places. They have like tons and tons of mezcals and tequilas. And he gave me like a masterclass on mezcal and things that like that I didn't know. This is Dan Suro and uh, I'll leave a link to his Instagram as well. It's really nice. Uh, and it kind of talking about some of the dangers of these celebrity brands of tequila and how they're not good for farming and the industry and all that. So, you know, so I'm going to have to consult with him because he's really cool about answering questions. I don't know about Cimarron Blanco. I have a feeling that's the kind of thing they wouldn't serve there. But again, this article is about good well spirits. And it seems actually kind of Philly focused because somewhere in Philly comes up again. So Mezcal was Del Maguey Vida. And that makes sense to me I, just because they're one of the few Mezcals that has been able to get their price down. I'm not sure what Dan would say about that either. Um, just in terms of sustainability and farming and all these things that we think are important. But at the end of the day, if you're talking about well spirits, like, you know, you have to be able to get the cost down. So if you're going to have um, Mezcal in the well at all, it must might as well be that. It's $35 a bottle where I am right now. And so I don't know how that relates to other places. And so it says... While the market for high-end sipping mezcal has exploded, the selection of high-quality mezcal that's still affordable enough to put in each cocktail has stayed firmly centered around Del Maguey Vida, says Friday, Saturday, Sunday's McDonald's. That's Paul again. So, yeah, I agree with that. Um, so, you know, I just want I just want everybody to follow him because he's really cool. And if you're in Philly or on the East Coast, that's one of the places that I would go for great food, great drinks. It's not a sponsor. <laughs> I wish. I mean, you know, but at the point, it it just it's good. It's good. So, uh, so bourbon. They separate bourbon and rye, and don't talk about scotch in the article, which I think is kind of interesting. I, you know, have I've been kind of critical of scotch, so that doesn't bother me. But uh, for bourbons, uh, old granddad bonded. Uh was the highest ranked bourbon for a high quality well spirit amongst bartenders. These are mostly head bartenders too. So keep in mind that they're considering the cost, of course, when they're, you know, cause they're the ones typically responsible for doing the costing of the cocktails and all that. And an honorable mention was four roses, yellow label. That makes sense to me too. Um, for rye, it goes Rittenhouse, which Rittenhouse is was named after Rittenhouse Square in Philly. So it's a I think it's still made in Philly, I believe. And so Mueller of Philadelphia's R and D, that's a cocktail bar in Philly that we also went to, and I didn't like that much. 
wasn't that good to me. Uh, but Mueller, I don't know who that is, of Philadelphia's R&D sums it up perfectly. Quote, everything you could need from a rye whiskey is in Rittenhouse. And I agree with that. It's a good, it's a good high quality rye whiskey for a very good price. And the honorable mention there was Old Overhalt. We, uh, in the bar that I mentioned, we used Old Overhalt in our well for a variation of a Manhattan uh, because of the price, it's a it's a fair bit cheaper than Rittenhouse, in all honesty, and it's not bad. It's I think the the rye is bonded too, which means all the grains come from one season, one harvest season. So you and the minimum age statement I think is three years. So like it's all you know, it's all legit. Um, and it's very cheap for the price. So. You know, I comment below what are your if you're a bartender, what are your favorite well spirits? Um, or if you're not a bartender, you just like drinking at home, what is your more what is your favorite cost effective um spirit in any given category? It doesn't have to be all of them. And uh, as always, we're also answering questions on Twitter. Twitter and in the YouTube comments uh, that we'll answer live once we get this going a little bit more. So I want to segue right into a, uh, I think I'm, I'm new to this. I don't think I'm supposed to say segue now that I think about it. I think I'm just supposed to do it, but, but that's a perfect transition <laughs> for an article also by Punch, it's more recent, called Forget Your Call Drink. Miami's El Salon has removed liquor branding from its bar in favor of a concise selection of house-blended spirits. This is an article that, like, blew my mind. There's not been a lot of innovation in this industry for a long time. And, like, huh. truly something unique. I remember I was talking to... This is years ago. The head bartender at the time of the Nomad, which you know has won every award known to man in the cocktail world, and the head bartender was telling me he's like, you know, the reality is, it's all kind of been done now by now, in the in the sort of craft cocktail world. In other words, you're not going to introduce flavors in a way that nobody has tasted before and really presents something in a way that nobody has seen before. I mean, there's obviously places like the aviary who do things that are just so extravagant. It's like the, it's like the balloons and cocktails and all this crazy stuff. But I think like, even for, so they don't do that at the nomad, but they just like, he's like, there's not many, there's, first of all, there's only so many flavors, there's only so many concepts and there's only so many people with a palate. So there's, there's not, there hasn't really been a lot of things that have been done unique, even here in a lot of years. And I'm like, dude, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Cause I was kind of at the time I was like pretty young, I was coming up and I'm like, you guys have one best bar in the world and you're telling me this. And he's like, well, yeah, I mean, so they rotate their cocktails seasonally and their cocktails are great and all that. And they have high standards and I'm not taking anything away from them. But he's just, what he's saying was that there, it was a time in history like we've reached a peak in history where it's like you can't, there's no, there's not much more to be done in terms of innovation in the cocktail world. So until I saw this and I'm like, man, this is maybe the most unique thing that I've seen in a long time. So basically from what I understand, this place in Miami called El Salon is, has, is blending their own spirits from other um, spirits to and putting all the bottle their own bottles on the back bar with no branding so it says what is a bar without a back bar <clears throat> quote what is a bar without a back bar full of similar spirits labels while house blends of bitters vermouths and aperitifs aperitifs are an established part of many bars handbooks few have taken the concept to its logical extreme until now el salon which opened in late November at Miami's Beach Esme Hotel, is going all in on house blends using only its own custom recipes across the menu. No Tito's, no Hendrix, no Don Julio here, and quote. I don't know why this got me so excited, but I wanted to you know, reference this because of earlier we were talking about the sort of tyrants that are these brand reps 
sometimes he's like, yeah, fuck them. You know, we don't need them. I mean, I was, and also there's never been, I don't know of any other business in the entire world. And I'm being dead serious. Let me know if you can think of one that has more product placements than a cocktail bar or restaurant with so many spirits on the bar. Right? Like seriously, think about this. The closest thing I could think of is like, my fucking mic is all stupid. The closest thing I could think of is um, like if you watch TV for a few hours, you might see 10, like maybe 20 commercials. I don't know. There's a lot of commercials now, but still doesn't compare to, and that's a little different. That's actually not even really a good comparison because that's like, that's advertising. That's kind of a different thing. I mean, I guess it's kind of still the same because it's attention and that just kind of is what marketing is now, but it doesn't even come close to the amount of spirits that you see on a back bar when you go to any bar or restaurant. And I'm like, think about how many, this is like a mind fuck. Think about how many products that we're just doing free advertising for in bars and even like here, like taking photos and videos of cocktails. Snoop Dogg actually on Joe Rogan said that the, you know, he started his own gin because the owners of these gins were stupid, you know, cause you know, back in the days they're shouting out Tangeray and Bombay and all this stuff. And then they're like, they're like, yeah, we don't really want to pay him. And I'm like, that's idiotic. And obviously marketing has changed a lot in the last, you know, two decades or whatever. But I'm just like, that's kind of how bars are right now. They get they're not getting paid at all to do all this free product placement. So this guy, his name's Chris Hudnall. He's like, why do I want to do all? I don't think this is actually the only reason. I'm just kind of speculating here. So I don't want to, I would eventually like to talk to him, but he's like, but it makes sense to me. It's like, why do we want to put all these product, your products for free on our back bar and we're selling, and you know, being, close to the hearts and minds of people doing free advertising for you. Why? The bar business is just kind of unique in that way where I think the, the distributors, the reps, the portfolio managers, they got complacent because it's the fucking easiest fucking business in the world. I'm sorry that I have to curse, but it's like, like this guy I'm talking about earlier, like you can't hire a decent salesman to, it's not even that hard. You're selling booze. It's a product that fucking sells itself. <sighs> so the brainchild, Chris Hudnall, who spent five years as director of bars for Soho House North America before co-founding the hospitality brand Lost Boy & Co. El Salon has a modest back bar lined with plain looking bottles, identical in height and shape. Each one holds a proprietary blend of gin, mezcal, rum, or scotch each with two or three variations classed as traditional, versatile, extraordinary, concise. Menu descriptors provide guidance, burnt sugars, dark berries, oak, pine, spice, etc. For extraordinary rye, light body, bright floral, fruit for versatile tequila. I think the reason why, like, just kind of as a as so somewhat of a marketing guy, I got so excited about this is because we like to pretend that people don't drink with their eyes. I guess, I mean, that's a weird way to say it, but we like to pretend like all these things like culture and label and branding and marketing don't matter in the industry. We like to pretend that. And sometimes, you know, I find myself being complacent, but the reality is that nobody has a fucking palette anymore. So they're, the reality is most people are just, they're only buying products because they're celebrity brands and because their friends drink them and because they saw them on Instagram. And so I'm like, the, I mean, The Rock is about to make a billion dollars from his tequila. And Mazel, you know, I'm not educated enough to give a, a sort of like a moral you know, description of why that's not great. There's other people that we're hopefully going to interview that could talk more about it. 
So I don't have a problem with it, but the point is I just really, this just is like, it's one of the few things in the industry that got me really excited for a long time because I just, he's just, it's truly unique. And so, you know, and the reality is like most people, they want a quick fix. They want, it's basically, it's just like authority bias and so, social proof. Is somebody important drinking this and are other people that I know my friends drinking this? So he removed all that and he's building, I think, people's palates and 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 shaking up the narrative by giving them descriptions in uh, basically just like the um, tasting notes. So the only one issue that I could see is that you theoretically could put kind of crappier spirits in, blend them up and charge a premium for them. But I'm not by any stretch saying that he's doing that. I just think that's a that's an obvious that's an obvious uh that's an obvious little thing hiccup to this which but i still i think it's awesome and really at the end of the day the thing the reason why i'm i'm most excited about this to bring this full circle is because he's taking power back from these fucking uh overlord portfolios here's the thing that a lot of people don't really realize there's about three to four companies that control almost every single spirit that you see on any given back bar if you go to any country in any bar in the country, let alone kind of like the entire West, like at the end of the day, you know, it's, it just is what it is. The, 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 the move in people, the move in like these celebrity brands and people uh, starting even their own, just like small distilleries just to exit because you can exit for sometimes 10 X revenue because portfolios buy up all the competition. That's just what it is. So, you know, I, I like that he's flipping it on its head and then these reps don't have control over you. Plus it's like, you know, I, I just, there's just, it's just interesting. So, you know, he goes, we're not trying to be stuffy and snobby about it, but more educational. I didn't say that in the right way. <laughs> I don't think he... We're not trying to be stuffy and snobby about it, but more educational. Hudnall says, let's bring back spirits to what they should identi should be identified as, which is flavor. Yes. Yes. This is so cool. Like, I can't wait to go here. Florida is actually, you know, next. We, we went to Jacksonville for the Bar Review Series. I don't know why. I was in Georgia. That's why I was close. So, you know. More like Southern Florida will be next, and I cannot wait to go here. This article 100% put this place on the map. I think this guy's a genius. I think it puts him on the map. I don't know that everybody's going to be as excited about it as me, but like Conor McGregor exited Proper Twelve for you know to one of these proper portfolios for something like a hundred million, and it was like so. You know, look, I, I'm not making a moral argument here again, but that's the reality is like people want their drinks to be tied to some celebrity, but it was contract distilled. If anybody knows anything about whiskey, it takes way longer. I think it was, I don't remember. It was like three, four years max that he had it. Whiskey has to be aged. Mostly, mostly for three years minimum. It's Irish whiskey. I don't remember the company that contract distills it. Probably was James. I don't remember though, or whatever the parent company is. So basically, this place, uh, uh, I forgot the name, El Salon, um, they have distributors from all over and they're making like their own unique blends from the, these, what, from wherever. And to me, this is just awesome. Cause it's like, we're not going to be beholden to your, you know, whatever, you know, we're going to do, we're going to mix up your shit with other shit that other people own and you can't fucking do anything about it. So he goes on to say costing is a challenge because that, you know, you're talking about, you got to mix all these other spirits from all over. So that, that makes perfect sense to me. And we kind of touched on that. So why, why that would be hard is because I don't know how many different, you know, like kinds of, or brands of any given spirit that he's mixing together. But uh, yeah, you got to kind of cost them all out separately. So, but it's just math. So it's doable. Uh, but then he says another, uh, hold on. This is my favorite part. 
Another wrinkle. Pandemic-related supply chain issues have constrained some of our original recipes. Some bottles are now too allocated to use or simply not available, and sales reps haven't always been pleased to find a bar that undermines the traditional consumer brand relationship, though Hudnall says several have returned to El Salon on their own time to explore the menu. Yeah. And also, fuck them. Who gives a fuck? I mean, he's probably going to make more money by, you know, doing something truly unique and generating buzz and having great products and services than just some of these brand deals, which are important for the average, you know, bar restaurant. But this guy is obviously, I don't know him, but he's obviously in a league of his own. And these fucking, they're spoiled brats. They're spoiled brats. Like people in the industry know this. Like half the time you talk to these reps, it's like the daughter, the son of the founder of these importers and exporters. And it's very, so there's a lot of nepotism and it's very political because unfortunately, if you don't have lobbyists, like for in Pennsylvania, for example, on, uh, to get in with the PLCB, like you don't have sales in that state. So, and the same with the import, import export, it's all corrupt. So it's like you, you know, if you want to make money, you got to be in the pockets. And, but I'm not here to talk about that. I deeply believe in never talking about politics or religion behind the bar, only in a non political or uh, religious way. Oh, shit. I'm going to pour oh. myself some more. So like, but truly like I have a good friend and, you know, she was a rep when I was a head bartender at, at Papillon and we would hang out and she was good at it. And a lot of people are, but like a lot of the guys that were, we hung out with, like I would hang out with them. They were like Coke addicts. They like early 20, early twenties Coke addicts. Cause they eat and drink for free. So they got to do whatever they can to, to get pleasure. I'm not saying that we didn't have some good times, but like, it's like, who cares about the reps, man? Like, I understand it's unfortunate. You kind of got to do business with them as I've mentioned. And I do believe there's a way to do it in a way that, uh, that is advantageous to you as a head bartender, a bar owner. But if you can do it in a way where you don't need them and they're going to whine, like, <laughs> how dare There'd be one bar that doesn't do things in the traditional way that we send our reps to. You know, it's like, suck a dick. I shouldn't have said that. Forgive me. But I just like, it's annoying, man. It's annoying. Like people want to be innovative and you're stifling it as the distributors who are these fucking sometimes overlords of cocktail bars. And that's unfortunate. The reality is, as we've alluded to in these two articles, is a lot of times you're doing business with them, no, whether you like it or not. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. But like the idea of anybody being upset at this, that one bar isn't doesn't have your brands on it. I, will, I think everybody should do this. I mean, cause they're not, you're not really, you're not paying anybody. I mean, I understand you have the product and you're going through it, but liquor is just a weird business in that way. There's going to be like, this guy risked it all. There's going to be old timers that walk out of the bar because they don't have the, 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 the doers that they were drinking for the last hundred years. And there's going to be reps that aren't going to give them deals because of this. So he's taking a big risk by doing it and doing it differently. And they're like, well, we don't, uh, I mean, this is a theoretical situation, but I know them. So I know this is true. And he mentioned it. Harumph, I say. It's just like, shut up. It's awesome. It's really cool to see. And I can't wait to go. If you've been there, comment below. And also because we're going to Miami and, you know, a few cities in Florida to do the sort of the, the cocktail review series, let me know. You know, what your some of your favorite cocktail bars in Florida in general are. Let's go, like, I don't know, like, we'll stick with Miami or Tampa or whatever. I don't even know. I've been to Jacksonville already is what I'm saying. So, southern Florida. I know there's two coasts. I haven't spent a lot of time in Florida, if that's not obvious. But I can't wait to go. It's, uh, it's in the discussion for where we're going to move our headquarters. So... 
Quote, the cocktail menu focuses on approachable classics like martini, cosmopolitan, and mai tai, whose familiar templates can be customized by blend choice. We have a lot of people order a Negroni with traditional gin, and then the next round they order a versatile gin, and then the next one they order with extraordinary gin uh, just to taste difference in flavor, Hudnall says. You see the evolution. You know, I, I just think that's something I would do. I would try, I would, I would want to try every single spirit on the back bar. And I would probably ask about their blends, but I don't need to know what brands they are. I just want to know, you know, like what's the, in the gins, for example, like what's the, you know, what's the breakdown? Like how much juniper are you guys using? What botanicals are in this? And I understand the blends, but it's just like, yeah, I love it. I can't wait to go. Uh, so comment some of the co- uh, some of your top favorite Miami cocktail bars or Southern Florida cocktail bars. Um, I'm answering questions on Twitter and from the YouTube comments. So any questions you might have about bartending, cocktails, spirits, opening a bar, building your way up as a bartender, be you know becoming a head bartender, all these things that I get excited about. Comment below. Reach out to me on Twitter on t- at Tommy Alchemy. Let me know. I'm happy to answer. And eventually, once we get enough questions, I'll be answering them live on the show. As always, I am Tommy Alchemy, and that is it from me. Cheers. <laughs>